Our viewers, uh, greetings from Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. This is Ahona, and welcome to our event today. Thank you all for coming here and to have this roundtable with Dhaka Tribune on poet and authors creating strategy purpose in the Pacific. And we're about to start now and to start the program. Uh, I'm requesting Major General A. N. Muniru Zaman, President of BIPS, and Mr. Zafar Sohan, Editor of Taka Tribune, to uh, to give the welcome remarks for the program. Thank you. And first of all, Excellency, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to this discussion meeting and session on Quad and AUKUS. Needless to say that the strategic landscape is changing rapidly. Fundamental shifts are taking place in the strategic landscape, particularly in the Indo-Pacific region. So therefore, BIPS is partnering with Dhaka Tribune to discuss on some of the key strategic issues and this will be a series that we will do every month. We would welcome you to attend all our sessions. And the order of business today will be, after the welcome remarks, we'll go straight to the discussion, which will be followed by a, hopefully, a lively discussion session with the audience. Please feel free to give your comments, observations, ask questions, and I might remind you that we are speaking on record. So with that very brief remarks, I will hand it over to Zafar to give his remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, General. And thank you all, Excellencies, other distinguished guests, and the distinguished panelists for being here. This is probably the first in-person such event I have been to in many months, and I'm glad to see that things are finally slowly uh, getting back to normal. And I think that uh, seeing all of you here today is um, very encouraging because I think um, it suggests that we are moving back to a measure of normalcy. And I think it's also a reflection of how important this issue we are here discussing today is. As uh, the General had mentioned, this is an initiative which BIPS and Dhaka Tribune have undertaken to do once a month. And we really think that there needs to be more robust and more detailed discussion of the changing world in which we live, and especially what should Bangladesh's um, position in stance and policy policies be in this uh, changing geopolitical and geostrategic environment. As um, has been mentioned, we are going to start with um, opening comments by our three panelists, but the format, as you will have seen from the program, is meant to be a very wide-ranging and open one. We very much encourage all of you to participate, because what we're looking for here really is a discussion rather than a sort of a lecture or a seminar. So I strongly encourage all of you to um, take part and we're very keen to hear uh, what you have to say. This has been the, um, everyone who is present here has been sort of uh, handpicked and chosen to be someone who would really have something of uh, value to contribute to the discussion. And so we are as keen to hear what you have to say as we are to hear what our panelists have to say. Now, uh, with that, let us, uh, without further ado, let me um, pass the mic over to the first speaker, which would be no, Brigadier. I'll, I'll okay, go for it, uh, go for it, sir. Zafar, once again, thank you. As I said in the beginning, the Indo-Pacific region yeah. particularly is seeing some major strategic initiatives. And these strategic initiatives have deep-rooted consequences not only for the Indo-Pacific, but beyond the Indo-Pacific. We are also entering an era of strategic competition, which can very easily go beyond strategic competition to strategic com confrontation. Therefore, it is critically important for all of us in the strategic community to understand all the consequences of these initiatives. It is particularly important for me to say that 
the Asia Pacific region does not have a security architecture. And in the absence of a security architecture in the region, induction of major security initiatives can have consequences, if not managed well, can result in consequences that are not desired. We are also seeing initiatives that could target one nation or a group of nations. Although unstated, but many of the initiatives do indicate in that direction. The Quad, which was born in 2004, post-tsunami, had somewhat died down till it was resurrected in 2018 again after Trump's initiative for a foreign minister's meeting of the Quad. So Quad 2.0 got a real impetus with the present Biden administration's Quad virtual summit, which was followed last month by a Quad in-person summit in the White House. The AUKUS, which is the new player in the game, has added a new dimension to the whole strategic landscape and the strategic play here. We are also seeing with a lot of keen observation some of the shifting dynamics of the military or the hard security nature moving away from Quad to AUKUS. There is also a possibility of Quad expansion. There is also a real possibility of AUKUS expansion. Only yesterday, the New Zealand ambassador in Canberra has indicated that New Zealand is interested in joining AUKUS. This is quite a shift from earlier statement from New Zealand, when it said that any of the AUKUS subs will not be welcome in New Zealand waters. But New Zealand has indicated that it wants to join AUKUS primarily for quantum computing and for cyber security. So therefore, the developments here are happening not on a, on a daily basis, sometimes on an hourly basis. We therefore have to keep a very close watch on all this if we need to understand them well. With that remarks, I shall now go back to our distinguished panelists to give their initial comments, and they shall come back to you repeatedly as we interact with you subsequently. The first speaker will be Brigadier Shadul Anam Khan. And Brigadier Khan is the former associate editor of the Daily Star, and he shall give his initial comments, and all our discussants will give their comments for about eight to 10 minutes initially. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, General. <clears throat> The, the subject is uh, uh, AUKUS and uh, QUAD uh, creating ripples. I think uh, AUKUS is creating more than ripples. Uh, and this is why. If you, if you look at the map and you look at the Indo-Pacific, you'll find how vast it is. Uh, it stretches from the west coast of the west to the, to the western shores of India. Uh, it is the single most consequential region in the world for the US and for the rest of the world. And we talk of the Asian century, and the Asian century will be predominated by three countries who are in this region, in the Pacific. It is home to the world's most populous country, to the, to the largest democracy, and of course, to the largest Muslim majority countries. And it includes more than half the world's population. But that's not all. From the military point of view, among the 10 largest standing armies in the world, seven are in the Indo-Pacific. And six countries of the region have nuclear weapons. And they all have nuclear submarines. And one recent entrant is Australia, which is not a nuclear weapon country, but will have 
and nuclear powered submarines in due course of time. It has 10 of the world's largest, busiest seaports, 10 of the world's busiest seaports, and 60% of the global maritime trade transits through this, this, this region through Asia. One third of which goes through South China Sea. So that is the strategic importance of, 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 of Indo-Pacific in, in natural. So now this Indo-Pacific, the status quo is being disturbed according to, according to the Western perception by a pretender uh, to world power or to world leadership. And that is status quo, the Americans and its Western allies would not like to cede or would like to be disturbed. And they would not like to cede control or dominance of this region, this state empire region to a third country, i.e. China. So that is why the Quad and the AUKUS as a consequence. So my remit today is uh, to discuss about the military aspect of AUKUS, uh, talk about the maritime strategy of AUKUS and the security ramifications, as well as the implications in the region of AUKUS. <clears throat> now, as I was referring to, the AUKUS is a consequence of a perceived threat, of a perceived threat, uh, you may take issue with me, of a power which is assuming great predominance, China. So AUKUS is focused towards China, and there is no doubt about it. The primary reason is that China has grown leaps and bounds and so far as its naval expansion is concerned. It's very true because China, in number of ships, has overtaken US uh, in number only. So the number of men of war uh, uh, that, that, that China has at this moment in its arsenal is more. But don't be misled by number only. Uh, in terms of technology, in terms of ability to deliver weapons and weapon load, America is far, far, far ahead. In fact, America possesses nine times more the power to, to, to deliver uh, strategic missiles than China. Uh, in uh, uh, US has 9,000, China has 1,000 tubes. <clears throat> but at the moment, the US force in Indo-Pacific or US Indo-Pacific command has 200 aircraft, 2,000 aircraft, 200 ships and submarines. All US submarines are nuclear powered. Only eight Chinese submarines are nuclear powered. And one of the most troubling aspects, or most, most troubling uh, issue for the US and its allies is the Belt and Road Initiative, where they see the enlargement of the Chinese footprints well beyond the shore. So at one point in time, uh, China had neither the intention nor the means for power projection. At later on, perhaps uh, 40, 30, 40 years ago, it perhaps developed an intention, but didn't have the means. It now is trying, it has the intention, and now trying to achieve the means. So that is the, the change in, the, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this scenario. Uh, Munir has given the background of Quad, but Quad is actually a quasi-military. It's a quasi-military uh, military arrangement, uh, which late motive is, is to counter China. Uh, but till 2019, there was a lot of ambiguity about, about, about Quad. But come 1st of June, 2019, all ambiguity was removed. And therefore, what was, what was sort of uh, articulated was much more than what we were given to believe before 2019, of Quad being a very innocuous uh, arrangement where uh, the intention is to keep the, the, the Indo-Pacific free and open and, 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 and following sort of rule-based uh, rule -based arrangement a rule based regime uh, and, and, and that freedom of navigation would, 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 be, would, be, would be uninterrupted. Uh, that, was, that was all removed, all doubts were removed that it was not so innocuous as it was made out to be because 
what in short the paper spelled out was that US and its allies were out there to achieve peace through strength. Peace through strength. Implying effective deterrence, need be to have joint forces to be prepared to deploy <coughs> forward. And of course, the <coughs> it, it wanted to have a networked security architecture. These are all in black and white. So therefore, this became more than a quasi-defense arrangement. In short, that was uh, that was what. What happened to AUKUS? And why AUKUS now? Uh, there is no ambiguity that it is a defense uh, treaty. No ambiguity that the target is is, is one country. Uh, it is the most significant, I think, to my mind, most significant arrangement, treaty arrangement since 1945, 1949, when NATO was, uh, was, it was established. It was not unexpected because, you know, what led up to AUKUS? The only problem was that India perhaps was not willing to join this band. India didn't want to be seen as openly anti-China and therefore uh, uh, US and Australia, of course, Australia had its own compulsion uh, in fact, Australia was the main motivator uh, of AUKUS uh, that something beyond Quad had to had to be organized. In Australia, had its own strategic compulsion side re requirement because it was under tremendous pressure from China, uh, uh, diplomatically as well as militarily, as I said the naval buildup. So the appraisal of their strategic uh, requirements suggested <coughs> that uh, a, a, a trilateral. Uh, arrangement was was a better option, and Quad replaced to them Quad sort of AUKUS uh, was one such was one alternative. Uh, of course, along with Australian interest, there is also the innate interest of the U.S. to keep and maintain its military-industrial complex, and. And, and over the ages since 1949, you will see that be, behind uh, all this uh, American involvement in world affairs, in, 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 in conflicts, in all other issues, one of the driving force was to keep the military industrial, industrial complex intact. In fact, if I go to the, 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 the figures, uh, MIC accounts for more than 60% of the total U.S. manufacturing industry. So therefore, after after the U.S. after after the fall of the break of the Soviet Union, you had Iraq, you had terrorism. After you had Afghanistan, and then after that uh, unmitigated disaster in Afghanistan, you have China as the main threat. So, one of the one of the one of the sort of one minute, sixty seconds. <laughs> Uh, I'll use 120 seconds. What will happen is uh, Australia will become the seventh uh, nation in the world to have to have uh, to have nuclear powered power submarine. But not only that, there will be technology sharing also, including quantum uh, 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 technology as well as artificial intelligence. Don't ask me what quantum technology is because I don't know what it is. But it is a it is a very <clears throat> high sounding technology. Uh, you, this mobile is a quantum technology, for example. Yes. This is analog technology. So the, what is the maritime strategy for, for the AUKUS? Maritime strategy? You see, this, this AUKUS sounds to me like the like the Delian League. You recall the Delian League uh, in 478, 479 against the Persians, uh, led by the Athenians. Uh, uh, they said, you, you, you come together, I'll use, I'll use our navy to protect you. You give us the protection money. So now you have the you have, you have the modern day Delhi and League, replaced Iranians by China and and Athens U.S. So that it seems to me, but it's a very weak an analogy. But but their SSN investment in SSN reflects their uh, their, their their maritime strategy. What best to, to dominate the Pacific with with a vast water mass than 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 uh, than, than uh, sea crafts. But sea crafts are not safe. Surface crafts are not safe. This, the, the submarines are safer for various reasons. And I'll go into that. One of the important reasons is that uh, 
surface crafts cannot access some parts of South China Sea. That's one of the one of the very 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 telling compulsions is safer. So that is basically the 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 the, 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 the maritime strategy. Do not cede authority of the uh, in the Pacific to China. Come what may, they will not. The preponderance of in the Pacific will be will be uh, dominant. Will, Chinese preponderance will be will be countered. U.S. is already looking bases, military bases. Uh, they, they have already have bases in Australia, but they're looking for submarine bases in Australia. So, what will be the implications? I'll I'll go very quickly. The implications are, and I'll, I'll sort of explain it on it. And as as uh, the, the question answer session, the question is, people ask. The common refrain is, if it is Indo-Pacific, and if if Asia is is a, is is a dominant feature of Indo-Pacific, why is Asia in it? Where is Japan in it? Where is India in it? Where are other Asian countries in this? The three countries are, the tribes are, they're all Anglo-European countries. So where is Asia? There is no Asia. Japan sideline, India sideline. How does it matter? Is India happy? Well, it's a mixed feeling in India. You see, they would like to counter China, but they would not like to pull the trigger. They would like to fire it on somebody, putting the gun on somebody's face. So they are quite happy with the arrangement. But they are not, they're also not very happy that they've been side. They've been sidelined, uh, I'll not say ceremoniously, but then in ASEAN there's a mixed reaction. There are who think that it will be it will be a big arms race, but there are some who feel that this is the proper strategy to counter China. For example, Vietnam. For example, uh, ma, ma Cambodia. <clears throat> they are, uh, and and of course Philippines. Whereas Malaysia and Indonesia uh, have not taken this this this, this news too well. Uh, for South Asia, I think India may feel ditched, but it's not, it's not too, too unhappy. At the end of the day, this is what will lead to, to in, 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 in sort of strategic paranoia, it's known as the security dilemma or the, or the, or the security fallacy. As the, as the British Prime Minister said, that it will, it, will, it, will, it will lead to peace and prosperity, but I think it will also lead to an unbridled arms race. This is what security fallacy or security dilemma is. That you have, you have nuclear weapons and they'll proliferate of weapons because you know you'll not use nuclear weapons. So instead of when you don't use nuclear, you can't use nuclear weapons to supplant that. You have you you will uh, proliferate. You will buy. You will acquire non-nuclear weapons. So that so this will give a spiral uh, growth of of of, illicit, of of licit weapons. And when you have unbridled growth of uh, legal weapons, a good part of it goes to the illicit market. So I think there will be both a profession of uh, legal and illegal. illegal. So, so it will be a cost of, uh, at the cost of, if there is peace and security, the cost of um, uh, arms, arms, arms uh, proliferation. Already 47% have uh, of defense spending in the last one year have, have uh, they've increased in 47% in, in, in the Pacific, led by China and India. So you can imagine what will happen. South Korea is rooting for a nuclear power submarine. Uh, um, one fears that uh, there may be, we may go into a Thucydides trap where the rising power will be contested by the existing power and there may be, there may be sort of confrontation, strategic confrontation. I do not feel there will be because too much economic, uh, uh, economy is at stake uh, to, 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 to for this to countries to what will happen is that there will be uh, hybrid warfare, other modes of warfare, smart warfare, hybrid warfare, where there'll be no combatants involved, but be other technologies involved, which will target various establishments to the detriment of the, of the parties concerned. So therefore, there may not be physical confrontation, but there may be other forms of hybrid warfare. The political message, 30, 30, 30 seconds, the political message is that this AUKUS shows failure of Western strategy vis-a-vis -vis China. U.S. had, uh, or the West had felt in its support for Chinese economic growth that China perhaps will adopt the liberal, the Western liberal way of economy, Western way of life. China did not. So they had, they, they thought that they will fall in line. China did not. In fact, China has got its own way, learned from Russia that before economic development, political, political development is immaterial. So therefore, China has learned and China has not fallen for, 
for, for the, the, the Western, Western liberal career. The, as I said, the relapse of the balance of power game, and it is an acknowledgement, not only of failure, but of a, of, of, of a severe vulnerability that, that the Americans suffer from at this point in time of, because of the threat they feel that comes from China. And let's stop here. Thank you, Brigadier Khan. And you raised some very interesting questions. One of the questions that intrigues me also as an observer is where is Asia here, particularly where is South Asia here? Because if you go back to the Quad Summit statements, the first one, the virtual one, and the in-person one, both statements talks about the very foundation of Quad depends on ASEAN centrality. So if it depends on ASEAN centrality only, where does South Asia figure in this? South Asia except India, is it irrelevant to the whole process of Quad? So that is a big question that I lay before you. I'm sure you'll have some wise answers to this question when you come to the discussion session. The Quad depends and was born out of the vision of Indo-Pacific as a single maritime strategic space. A vision that was shown to the world by Prime Minister Abe in 2007, when he talked about the dynamic coupling of oceans of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. This is also the vision of confluence of nations, of seas and oceans, that together forms into a dynamic strategic space. And that is a space that we is now being battled between powers in the West and powers elsewhere. We don't state the names, but we know who it is. So it is a strategic game that is developing and rapidly developing. We need to understand this very carefully. Our next speaker is very competent to give us comments on these issues that we raise, and is Mr. Tohi Dosan, a career diplomat, a former foreign secretary of the government of Bangladesh. Tohi, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, firstly, uh, these are my own understanding of things. Um, for a very long time, the US strategic thinking actually centered around two places separately, um, the Pacific and the Atlantic. Um, Indian Ocean was a bit in the background. Rise of China and the uh, subsequent BRI, string of pearls, etc. Uh, the importance of the Indian Ocean has suddenly snowballed. And so, um, although the, uh, the squad thing or in the Pacific strategy it had actually started a little earlier, but then hardly except people who are extremely concerned, hardly other people knew uh, about these terms. Uh, as long as the Chinese uh, initiative of BRI and uh, uh, this uh, string of pearls came, uh, you know, just in front of the eyes of uh, all people. Now, that way, we should say that, um, although it might have started earlier, but uh, the, uh, the uh, IPS and uh, also Quad is sort of a reaction rather than, uh, uh, you know, at, uh, independent initiative. Um, about AUKUS, uh, uh, excuse me for using the term, but uh, I think it's sort of a uh, white English speakers, part of a white English speakers group who understand each other much better than uh, the Asians or, you know, Africans, etc., etc. Uh, and to my mind, uh, at least in the shape that it is today, AUKUS, in spite of the um, you know, nuclear submarines going to Australia, is not going to, uh, as it is, going to change the strategic scenario very greatly. Because these three countries, in any case, they had been pretty close all the time. And uh, if one was in danger, the other, other would have come up to help them anyway. But of course, uh, uh, as my previous speaker had said, and uh, also uh, General Munir has pointed out, that where is Asia? 
as long as Asia is not coming, as long as Asian countries are not becoming, of course, AUKUS, the name says only these three countries, but then um, if you have some other structure uh, with similar motive in which Asian countries are coming in, at least Japan, India, uh, of course, as uh, as uh, uh, Ram pointed out that uh, India uh, doesn't want to do the shooting itself. Uh, could be, but then uh, could be a part of uh, a bigger plan. Now, will this uh, quad, uh, will there be an extension or expansion of this quad? There is definitely an effort by the US to uh, expand this quad. We know that uh, last year, in October, it's almost a year now, um, Stephen Began had uh, made a visit to this area. And there was a very interesting thing that uh, he met our minister uh, and state minister. And then uh, there are absolutely contradictory statements about what had transpired between them. Uh, our minister said that no, he has not mentioned about squad. And he said that, well, he did mention about squad. Um, I would rather believe him in this respect because there was no other reason for him to rush to this place at that time when his regime was uh, nearing the end. Uh, of course, uh, he did mention about what, which means that um, definitely the U.S. wants an expansion uh, of the Quad. Um, of course, there has been the issue of centrality of the uh, of the ASEAN, but um, ASEAN, I, I don't think that the uh, the, uh, the nations of ASEAN they share the same interests. There is a big difference in, uh, among the interests of uh, those who are literal uh, of the South China Sea and those who are not. Uh, we have seen that in many cases uh, where there is a hue and cry among the uh, literal uh, South, uh, South China Sea literal states, uh, the countries of ASEAN uh, which do not have a, uh, have, are not literal uh, of the South China Sea, they rather prefer to keep quiet, not to displease China, etc., etc. So that, that is always there. Uh, one question could arise that um, would Bangladesh perhaps join the Quad? For the moment, it's, it has not. We know because uh, uh, Stephen Began uh, has definitely proposed and uh, the response from Bangladesh was definitely not positive. Um, but you never know. There could be a situation in which, uh, you know, if a choice had to be made, uh, Bangladesh could join. But uh, in, in the present and in very near future, I don't think that is going to happen. Um, apart from this, that uh, uh, we also have this, uh, apart from the uh, South China Sea littoral states, we have this special relation between uh, China and uh, Myanmar, which we must also take into consideration. Uh, Myanmar is part of ASEAN, but uh, it definitely is not uh, going to uh, join anything that could be inimical to the Chinese uh, Chinese interests because uh, Chinese and Myanmar interests are very strongly intertwined. And uh, Myanmar gives China uh, the access to the Indian Ocean, direct access to Indian Ocean, uh, thereby, uh, in the Chinese perspective, reducing the over-dependence on the Malacca Strait to a great extent. And that will become, that will remain a very important consideration uh, for both these countries. Um, the AUKUS initiative, as we have already seen, that it has disturbed a little bit the US-Europe relationship. Uh, in the first place, the, the, uh, the French are furious because they lost a huge deal, uh, and which was uh, virtually, uh, you know, taken over by the, uh, by the two English speakers. And then, um, in fact, Germany has also supported, I do not speak of other countries, but Germany has also supported the position of uh, France and uh, was not very happy about the way it was done. Uh, uh, basically, it was, uh, it concerned a submarine deal, but then it has uh, much larger ramifications as we have already heard from the earlier speaker. Um, what can be the uh, possible fallouts? Uh, on the non-proliferation regime. Now, I don't think that that is very that is going to be very great because um, as long as Australia is not using nuclear weapons, 
if you look at it uh, at the uh, uh, submarines, the nuclear reactor produces electricity to around the, you know, instead of diesel uh, generators, you have, uh, uh, you know, nuclear generators. Now, nuclear generators for electricity generation, not in this context, but normally is, is there all over the world, including in Bangladesh, it's coming up. That way, technically, you can say that uh, it's not affecting the uh, proliferation regime. But then there is the question of uh, level of, uh, you know, uh, enrichment that is yet to be looked at. And I think that on this question, um, there will remain a debate of different of difference of opinions uh, among the countries and uh, will not be resolved very easily. And of course, the opinion of the uh, powerful will prevail. And um, some might say that uh, it's uh, actually uh, contrary to the uh, uh, regime, anti-nuclear regime, and others will say that no, it is not. So these are the issues that will continue there. But um, overall, the two initiatives which came, uh, well, again, I am saying that although uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy is much older, but then it has become more visible only recently. And that way, AUKUS came pretty quickly uh, in that train. So these are two things. Uh, that has happened in the strategic atmosphere of uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, I would say. And um, I'm sure that all countries, large and small, will continue to observe that what shape these, these initiatives take, what, uh, what consequences are coming up, uh, well, if not day to day, uh, from time to time. And uh, there has to be ultimately an uh, initiative in which not only these three countries, but uh, at least India and Japan and perhaps South Korea has to be a party to it. Uh, we don't know about uh, Indonesia as yet, uh, what will happen to it. Uh, could it be under the uh, system that AUKUS is uh, generating or will it actually go back to what it started earlier, the Indo-Pacific strategy. That is something that we have to see. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tohi. That was very precise. And uh, you again raised some very interesting questions. One of the questions that I also have in my mind is the enrichment level. From my understanding, the enrichment of uranium that will be needed for the nuclear subs will be up to weapon grade. And if we are enriching up to weapon grade, at what stage we cross the threshold for non-proliferation? Or who safeguards the weapon-grade uranium so that it doesn't cross the threshold? So these are a lot of unanswered questions, but then at the same time, I must say that AUKUS is evolving. It is absolutely a new concept, and it is evolving a lot of the non-clarity that exists today would have been clarified in coming months and years. But at the same time, we must also remember that in many cases, big powers, they want to play with strategic ambiguity. So we might be in for a very long period of strategic ambiguity as it relates to AUKUS. But if we are looking for AUKUS expansion, then we have to be very careful whether it becomes inclusive of Asian powers or become non-inclusive. Because there is one statement that I'm seeing in the press very recently, a statement by the British Chief of Defense Force, who has suggested on record that the AUKUS expansion should happen quickly, and the countries that he recommends are New Zealand, which I in the beginning I said was very color. Uh, closely followed by a statement by the New Zealand Ambassador or High, High Commissioner in Canberra. And the other two countries that he mentions are Canada and Japan. So our Indian friends are not going to be happy because it will be the only quad country which will be left out of AUKUS. So there is a dynamic play of power here and there is a very complex interplay of 
international and national interest. Before I hand over to the next speaker, the other question that I lay before you for the discussion period, AUKUS is all about deterrence. And if it is deterrence, then it is about relative deterrence. But the plan here is to build the submarines over a period of 20 years. So if it takes 20 years to build the X number of submarines that is in the contract, what will be the change of relative deterrence of the power for which it is intended? Because we have already seen last week that China has tested a hypersonic missile which has grossly alarmed the Americans and the West. So over a 20 years period, whether the deterrence that is intended can be achieved or not, that is a very big question I lay before you. So there are a lot of unanswered questions here. And you are the best judges to answer those questions when we come back to you for the discussion session. With that, then our next speaker is going to be Pervez Karim Abbasi from the East West University. Uh, thank you, sir. So I'm Pervez Karim Abbasi, but I would like to share that I'm feeling a bit jittery because after three titans in a row and a very elegant man of letters introducing us, I feel that I would not be up to the task. Let me give you a brief outline of how I'm going to present. A teacher never forgets his tricks. Number one, what is the geoeconomic rationale for AUKUS? So that's number one. Number two, how is it going to impact ASEAN, trade economy-wise? Number three, what would be the future trends in terms of the coming conflict slash cooperation slash strategic ambiguity between China and US? And the fourth question, which is on everyone's mind, how is it going to impact Bangladesh? So these are the four things we tried to send out, two and a half minutes worth. First and foremost, a lot has been said about US-Chinese strategic competition. In my mind, it's almost similar to the rise of Germany before First World War, when there were group formations, right? So you had the Entente Cordiale, and you had the Triple Alliance, and again, this was also a case of deterrence building. So what we have right now in AUKUS is a case of sub-regional block formation. Regional, that's quad, but AUKUS is a more flexible approach. It is not, what would I say, a knee-jerk reaction. Why so? Let me elaborate. What was the timing of AUKUS? Just probably two weeks after American withdrawal from Afghanistan. So this was also a strategic messaging also. Yes, negotiations were taking place for several months, but this was actually an expression of intent of America's recalibration of its policies. Because American policymakers had realized in Afghanistan, well, the Afghan populace, nobody asked, but that's another issue, is that why are we providing security over here? Because again, which are the countries which will benefit by American involvement in Afghanistan? Iran, China, Russia to a, central, to a certain extent, and of course, you also have Pakistan. Again, American withdrawal from this has created and this is my opinion. And as we can see over here, a lot of chaos. And even Pakistani uh, ex experts are saying that Afghanistan is close to the brink of collapse. That's one. But that has also resulted in a loss of face for America. So what has happened? It is signaling that it is going into Indo-Pacific to re-exert its hegemony which has been under challenge or criticism and to reassure its allies. America's association with Indo-Pacific is not new. Remember Hawaii, remember Guam, remember Diego Garcia. America has always been an active player in Indo-Pacific. But along with this, you have China, which exerts its historical sphere of influence. And that brings us with Australia. What about Australia? Now, if you recall that Australia has been in the midst of an ever-increasing spat with China, it had carried out legislation whereby it had criticized, again, foreign interference in domestic politics, and also it has targeted nationals mainly from China in terms of acting as saboteurs or as spies. China was very critical. 
what we had over there was unofficial sanctions on Australian export of coal, LNG, barley, and, and rare earth materials. Australia has estimated to lose about 6.6 .6 to 12.2 billion Australian dollars. China has not imposed sanctions, unofficial ones. Australia was in need of greater security. Yes, it is ironic that Australia was dependent on China for its robust growth. But then, when again, the Chinese were showing increased sensitivity to criticism, this was when Australia moved out. So what did we see? They, again, abandoned the deal that they had uh, come up with the French government, especially to the Naval Group, where the French government has a large stake over there. And I believe they were about in the process of uh, importing 12 short fin barracuda submarines, the diesel ones. And what have they moved on to? Now, primarily, the submarines that David has already talked about very uh, elegantly over here, usually it's either the astute class from Britain or the Virginia class of submarines, nuclear submarines from, uh, uh, from USA. And where would be the central staging location? HMS Sterling, which is located in Perth, the naval base. And this is going to give them greater depth and greater duration. And this is one reason why Australia has welcomed this kind of maritime protection. And Chinese Navy, the plans, their ever-expanding footprint has also uh, threatened and intimidated many of the ASEAN members. And of course, we are talking about quantum sharing, uh, quantum computing. We are talking about cybersecurity, technology sharing. So it is a very holistic platform. That is for Australia's case. And remember, the military, industrial, and technological com complex that we have, several billions of each of the submarine costs about several billions of dollars to construct. So this will be a windfall gain. That, along with this, that takes us to the ASEAN angle of this. South Asia, Southeast Asia and East Asia has a share of troubles with China because China was historically a predominant power. Japan, with Japan, you have the, what's in the name of an island. Senkaku Islands, according to the Japanese, or Deyu Islands in terms of basically the Chinese. In terms of South China Sea, again, the Nine Dash Line, and, and again, the allegations of many of the Southeast Asian nations about the Chinese actually going for terraforming over here, artificially constructing islands and building militias. I'm just mentioning two sides. I have no side to pick over here. Apart from this, uh, you also had the recent row with South Korea in terms of the third missile crisis, where they were actually the greater in, and see each of these countries, whether it's Japan, whether it's South Korea, whether it's the ASEAN countries, are increasingly dependent on China for trade and investment. So Chinese geoeconomic clout has increased. This is the fundamental thing that one has to take into account. And whereas even within ASEAN, the split, Cambodia and Laos are increasingly going with greater Chinese involvement. Brunei, and for that matter, Philippines, Duterte has done a flip. They are increasingly openly uh, enthusiastically supporting greater American and British involvement over here. And along with this, Indonesia, Malaysia, they are showing, they have protested the Australians, but they're okay with the final security provider, which is the United States of America. Vietnam is also quietly welcoming this, but they have greater ties with the Chinese. Along with this, along with this, the French have left in a half, but they're not going to go away. They have 2.2 million people within the Indo-Pacific region over the overseas territories. They have 7,000 soldiers over there. They have nuclear, nuclear powered uh, submarines over there too. So, and what we saw in recent times is President Biden trying to reach out to the French, President Macron, and we will see greater French involvement over here. As for Great Britain, moving away from European Union and striking its own deal, I think Great Britain became great because it acted on its own. And as a result, what has happened is it would not have formed a colonial empire if it had gone with continental Europe. It is time to find its own bearings. Again, uh, that is for Great Britain to find out and history to actually see which way it goes. Coming over here, what will happen in recent times? Or we will increasingly see greater competition between US and China. Though we are talking about whether there'll be a conflict between Taiwan, but that's America has unofficially drawn a line in the sand. 
the Chinese are going to always use a salami slicing technique and they try to impose pressure on them, but there will not be active confrontation. But there will always be a threat of war. But what is more likely, what is more likely is a sundering over of the global supply chain. Because already along with the blue, blue dot network, what America is trying to come up with is a less dependent on Chinese, China or China Sino-centric supply chain is trying to move away from it. Increasingly, countries like India are also moving into that direction. While China is coming up with a less West-centric supply chain over here. That's why you will see technology war, you will see network war, you will see the incipient space war, you're seeing the vaccine war, you're seeing the digital electronic platform war, currency war, and Along with this, one, just two minutes, sir. just, and along with this, it, this is a future projection looking into the crystal ball. In recent times, what we will also see is the conflict about rollout of technology, 5G technology, that directly affects us. Bangladesh has indicated that it is going to go for 5G technology, but we know that there's grave Western reservations. But for us, in terms of a resource constraint, it is a matter of feasibility. That's number one. Number two, there's an imminent uh, interest hike which is coming in the United States, which is going to impede global economic recovery. If the United States raises its interest, already we know inflation rates are going up. Fuel prices are going up all over. And there's Russia, we will not even bring that into. What will happen over there? The global economic recovery, whenever it is impeded, there'll be political instability across countries. China's Evergrande, $300 billion worth of real estate property going down under, sorry. And this is a signal that the Chinese economy is also under stress. The Chinese economy is under stress. The finance of BRI will be under a lot of stress. Bangladesh will be directly impacted. These are things that affects us more directly. And summing it up, historically, Bangladesh hasn't done well, or Bengal hasn't done well when it's taken sides in the clash of titans. The most recent example, which we forget, because we are very Anglo-centric, is the Battle of Palasi, the first unofficial world war. It was a seven years war between Great Britain and France, and with changing uh, partners in the continent. But you had the French East India Company and the British East India Company fighting it out. And what happened? Bengal lost its independence. The last independent Nawab Sirajuddullah strategic foresight did not take place. So we, as in Bangladesh, must be very careful. We already have our mini arms race with Myanmar. We have bought two submarines, they have got two submarines. What will happen over here? We are dealing with diesel class. Sorry, was, but then again, these are things that we need to know about. And the last part is Bangladesh's strategic neutrality will be greatly impacted by whichever country or group of countries can help us to resolve the Rohingya issues in a peaceful and in a speedy manner. Thank you. Thank you, Parvez. Uh, you again raised a, a number of interesting questions. And the one I would like to pick first is the battle for technology. As Bangladesh plans to roll out 5G, we need to take into consideration what sort of hurdles we have to cross. As the West tries to stop 5G rollout, Huawei is now actively patenting 6G technology. So the battle for technology is again raging fast. We, in, as small nations, need to be careful about this. The seas that are involved, the oceans that are involved, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, is also getting congested. In the Indian Ocean, we now see, for many years, active play of the Malaba series of naval exercises, which is again carried out by a selected number of nations. As of last two weeks, we are now for the first time seeing a joint Sino-Russian patrol in the Pacific which is again changing the game in the Pacific Ocean. We will be seeing a robust presence of the French, as Pervez has rightly mentioned, because the French consider themselves 
a resident Asian power because of their territories and of their citizens and the presence of their soldiers in the Asia Pacific region. So all the big powers are at play here. What we need to take note of that Bangladesh, though a small geographical entity, but the seventh largest nation in the world. So we have a definite role to play as an Asian power, as an Indian Ocean literal state, and as a strategic key player in the Bay of Bengal. So that is the reason that we have to be an active player in the game so that we are not left out, we are not trampled by others. With that cautionary note, I will now open the floor for your questions and comments. Please feel free to give your observations, comments, or ask questions. While asking questions, you might direct it to one of our speakers, or it may be to the whole panel. We have the first question from Mr. Shamsher Mobin Chaudhary. I will introduce him. He is the former Foreign Secretary of Government of Bangladesh. Thank you, uh, and I think from all the members of the panels, we have heard very interesting and indeed uh, thought-provoking comments. Uh, military alliances uh, are nothing new, especially since the Second World War. So let's hope we are not creating a fear mongering just because our goods has come into existence. More or less, these are <coughs> posturing and security alliances, military alliances change, they formulate, they reformulate. Also, back has uh, disappeared. Now, even when uh, NATO and Warsaw Pact were facing each other, literally facing each other, with great military might that existed in the states, and I happened to be living in a frontline Warsaw Pact country at that time, facing another frontline NATO country, which was East Germany and West Germany, and living in Eastern Germany. There never was an outbreak of hostility as such, because militaries, as Professor Sun said himself, I think, in a very recent television talk show when I was present, the military's role is not only to uh, fight a war, it may also be used to prevent breakout of war. And sometimes you do that if you are prepared militarily with sufficient strength on either side, creating a mutual sense of deterrence between each other. Now, Bangladesh, I must say that, and this is coming to my various things that are uttered in that. I think Bangladesh has demonstrated great maturity in being able to find the right kind of balance. For me to give you the word strategic balance, but I'd say Bangladesh has sought balance generally. If you remember 1972, Indo-Bangladesh Treaty of 25 Years, which uh, Anam knows very well about, uh, stipulated that in case of an outbreak of war between India and China, it was signed in 1972 for 25 years, India would be allowed to use Bangladesh territory to carry its uh, military hardware soon. This was not a very popular treaty. We all know that. I mean, it was uh, later. In 19, 7, 1997, the daughter of the Prime Minister who signed that treaty did not renew it, which showed that we want to stay out of any potential conflict between India and China. I do not foresee a real outbreak of hostility between AUKUS members, Quad members, or China on the other hand. But there will be a lot of posture. So without sounding uh, alarmist about it, and I would go back to the question that all of you have asked at times, that, and all of you have said, and only that you said it uh, also very uh, categorically, that Bangladesh has earned for itself a place in the larger Asian theater today. We are a player of consequence. We have demonstrated uh, ourselves to be a responsible neighbor. Uh, we are in the IRR with uh, Australia and Japan and all that. We have very close relationship with Japan, China, India, Australia, to a certain degree. So I would say that Bangladesh should wait and watch, not get alarmed by it. I'm sure the ASEAN countries will not have a unified stand on this. They will have very stand. I saw no reason for India to get too upset that it is being quote unquote left out of office. Uh, neither would be Japan. So let us observe where it moves. Uh, uh, 
Australia, the US, and the United Kingdom, all of them have very strong relationship with Bangladesh. They also know where Bangladesh stands. They also recognize that Bangladesh, countries like Bangladesh today has uh, be, are in a position to uh, employ a sense of strategic autonomy in deciding its own foreign and defense policy at the same time keeping our national interests in mind and maintaining strategic uh, balance between strategic threats. So I would like to see a more kind of watchful uh, position from Bangladesh. But yeah, self countries do it another matter. But let us not uh, sound the uh, alarm bells that we're going to be out into war. Regarding the question of uh, nuclear proliferation, and Anam keeps on coming back to that time and again. A famous Indian judge and uh, diplomat, uh, Mani Patiwala, I think the Indian Academician Defense here has heard of him. He once said that NPT, the Nuclear non proliferation Treaty, is basically a document to disarm the unarmed. And that is still the case. So their forms are different from the proliferation. You can have propulsion driven submarines, you can have armed, nuclear armed submarines. But nuclear technology is cannot be the monopoly of the few. We are moving into peaceful use of nuclear weapons that are many others are doing that. I would say that let us wait and watch, keep a close eye, and expect that we also be heard by the Alpus members, by the Quad members, and the larger thing. Bangladesh today has a place in the Indo-Pacific theater. It has a role to play in the Indo-Pacific theater and is capable of playing a role in the Pacific theater. Thank you very much. So we know that in the future there will be a lot of race, particularly with concerned armed race, because we are not, not much armed, uh, uh, and unlike other big powers. So what the, uh, Moreover, we are also suffering from, as I was the then secretary, I know, and climate change. So I must concern about the impact of this arms race on climate change. The very, uh, uh, now the globe, uh, global uh, leaders, they are thinking what the proliferation race of this is uh, arsenal, nuclear arsenal, other things that are giving heat, emission of heat in the atmosphere. So that will have direct impact on climate change, global warming. We are now should be making a wise heart globally. This sort of arms race in the region, which are climate and vulnerable countries like Bangladesh, we should raise that voice. We are not going to compete neutrally with any big powers. What we need that their activities should not have adverse impact of climate change, global warming. That should be our voice and we are Effective of that. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this very uh, interesting discussion that is going on. Uh, especially, I must thank some of the panel members, uh, General and uh, Mr. Hussey. Um, they are very pointed statements you are making. Uh, something I like to say, I mean, coming from a small power, if you call ourselves a power, uh, there is something missing about the centrality of the Bay of Bengal. I know it was kind of mentioned in the past name, but we should appreciate, uh, in a way, the strategic position we have. Professionally, I'm an archaeologist historian, but I've been working on this from second millennium BC to see the same circuits are operating even now. The movement of resources, the strength it had economically, the, the nature of power we had, the connectivity we had, so the centrality of Bay of Bengal has to be seriously taken note of. My country and your country, Bengal, and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, we are at the two corners of the Bay and we are connected. In fact, just early this year, uh, we had discussions at the Independent University about the Indo-Pacific and Bay of Bengal connectivity. And just last three days ago, four days ago, I was making a presentation at the Bay of Bengal governance. Now, I think we should seriously look at this uh, because we should also appreciate our position. I think the uh, Honorable Secretary just mentioned uh, the critical importance of Bangladesh and the position it had taken. Uh, we have the strongest economy in a way to look in a regional impact, the population. 
uh, what you call the educational levels. Uh, also, our economies are strong, especially Bangladesh is a rising power. Now, what are the stakes we have in this whole of a play or the hegemonic play? Uh, are we willing to go with this party or that party or willing to carve out a neutral power in our region? I mean, this is something we have to seriously look at because we wouldn't want others to come and tell us what to do. Uh, I'm not being rude about this kind of thing, but uh, we should be looking at, as a small nation, mine is a small nation, Bangladesh. We are looking at the blue economy. Uh, we are looking at all those aspects that have to be taken cognizance of and to see the centrality of Bay of Bengal and to chalk out a propaganda, or sorry, a policy how we can get together. Bipstek is there, but I'm not sure whether it's really working because it's more economic thing. We are looking at how people-to-people -people connectivity can be so powerful. And we should be seriously looking at these aspects as well. Gentlemen, thank you very much. What I think uh, is a uh, rather sharp entry of AUKUS has added more confusion and it will add more strategic dilemma, uh, particularly in the Europe and the Western countries. As you see that, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific strategy, it had a, you know, uh, difficult pathway, how to define it. Then came the con confusion when the France declared it had Indo-Pacific strategy, with the focus that we are not choosing a side between US and China. And after the AUKUS uh, has come up, the next day, European Union, which is so lethargy, they have come, out, come up with their own Indo-Pacific strategy, where they have mentioned the focus is to increase uh, maritime uh, deployment in the Indo-Pacific without uh, you know, fully confused where is the uh, you know, uh, deployment, why is the deployment, and also. Now, uh, suppose uh, this goes ahead, uh, the board moves ahead, it is uh, not finding against the expansion partner. Uh, it, it is a, a you know a saying of the, the based on democracy and human rights. But so far, the expansion partner has been uh, Cambodia, a communist country. It doesn't go with the democracy. Again, the August, uh, we may hear a lot of expansion <coughs> story. Uh, but uh, uh, a surprising name is coming also Vietnam. That it could be uh, with the US uh, uh, alliance, it could be uh, there. So whatever happens now, uh, what I uh, uh, come to see is that nobody says that China is my enemy except for US. The, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, conflicting uh, situation. Otherwise, in court, you say that all the three members other than USA, they never mentioned uh, uh, China. The AUKUS, it has not mentioned China. But uh, whatever happens, China reacts very violently. That, that, that creates the, another confusion. Now, what does the panel think when uh, this uh, quad has to uh, get uh, more momentum as, uh, uh, you know, uh, the America is moving uh, to the Indo-Pacific? Or rather, it has to move because it has withdrawn. It has lost its uh, ground uh, in, in uh, losing its ground in the Middle East and Afghanistan and all this area. So, uh, and uh, 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 the Biden wants to say now the prosperous Indo-Pacific. He has little shifted from the uh, you know uh, free and open, inclusive Indo-Pacific. Is the earlier uh, you know pivot Asia or the rebalancing strategy of Obama is moving towards that. Now, if the Quad has to move, if the AUKUS has to move, now they have to come uh, in this uh, maritime, single maritime space. So here uh, the question comes, what will happen? How they are going to uh, interact with each other, uh, the Quad and uh, AUKUS? Uh, you know, uh, in uh, normal wisdom, it says that they have to be complementary because they belong to the same group or same uh, security uh, perception. But the problem is that Munir has mentioned that 
Asia Pacific doesn't have a security architecture. And now is the situation where earlier USA has to be the security underwriter for Asia. It is no, no more the security underwriter. Rather, it doesn't want to be a security underwriter because uh, it wants alliance, it wants burden sharing, it's on payment. So uh, the, 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 that's the area. So all this coming together and uh, China uh, as it reacts against them uh, uh, for uh, its uh, own pu purpose. Uh, what does the panel think uh, if this converging si situation takes place, how th this will uh, take place between China, AUKUS and the Quad, how uh, this will happen? Now, uh, my comment about the uh, Indian Ocean, uh, High Commissioner Prof. Long Excellency has mentioned a very good point. Now, in the whole discussion, Indian Ocean hardly has come. Asia is not there. Yeah, uh, coming. The Asia is not there. Indian Ocean hardly we have uh, mentioned. Uh, and uh, another Asia is not there. So, in a way, it's a, it's a great game scenario where the great game players, they choose a target. And, uh, you know, they, they fix their thing. You, uh, I hope you know it, that already Indian Ocean is not at the middle bay. Already without any talk or without any uh, thing going on them. It is the most militarized ocean in the world. More than 180 ship, uh, naval ships is uh, being patrolled uh, in the Indian Ocean right now. Now think about the impact. When the European Lethargic Europe Union has also said that we are going for the maritime uh, uh, deployment. And uh, uh, Germany is already sending ships. UK, uh, you know, which is global uh, Britain role, uh, it has sent two ships also the aircraft carrier. Uh, now, with this, you see, the, when you move to the South China Sea, you have a difficult situation. You will be severely challenged by China. So, whatever marshalling point, that's to the Indian Ocean. That is the here. So whatever the influence operation, influence the thing is going to happen, I think that's on the Indian Ocean literally. There comes our vulnerability. Uh, we'll be under intense pressure in this upcoming, uh, you know, uh, uh, nuclear or non-nuclear proliferation and the arms race, and particularly the influence uh, uh, building of this power the Indian Ocean littles uh, will be in, in serious issue. And Bay of Bengal being the, you know, literal of the ASEAN, the ASEAN is the central of everything. Uh, again, we are becoming attached to the centrality and uh, uh, being access to the Indian Ocean is very, very uh, important that uh, we have something uh, uh, among us. And our difficulty is that Asia is now failing to uh, make their own alliance. No more alliances taking place between the Asian countries. We can't do that because it has to be sponsored by uh, some big power. And that's the thing. So in that scenario, I think the smaller state, as I mentioned, we have to be very watchful. And we must not be dragged by anything because if you are dragged, uh, you will be, you know, in, in a ship scenario. I'm a sailor. I know when you go near a big ship, we maintain a bigger distance. Because if you go near the, the, the suction effect, it will be just uh, you know going and banging uh, with that. Uh, so uh, for Bangladesh, uh, uh, our only thing is development interest. Wh wherever it takes us, to whom power it takes us, we should go. But with the distance, so that we are not smashed. And everybody knows that Bangladesh will never come so close that I can uh, you know we can take it. Thank you. In 2017, when Bangladesh Prime Minister visited India, then uh, the two countries declared that our relations are more than uh, steady. So then we come to uh, Japan, the uh, uh, world country. Japan was keen during Second World War to put its footprint in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, so in this corner context, and Japanese ambassador just uh, uh, last week, two weeks ago, announced at the program uh, in the National Press Club that the Matarkari project is a part of Indo Pacific. So, so according uh, till now, Bangladesh indicated that Bangladesh is keen to engage in the softer part or economic part of the Indo Pacific. 
Okay, so do you think that Bangladesh has uh, gone already out of balance, allowing a court country knowingly or unknowingly uh, 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 put a footprint in the Bay of Bengal with, uh, with uh, constructing a multi-dimensional, multi-purpose project uh, like Mother Um I have a couple of questions uh, one, to the panelists. Uh, one is that we, you all uh, know, are aware that there are also China-based uh, political and economic uh, institution uh, in which a lot of countries are also members. For example, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We know that this is a political forum where uh, a lot of countries of Eurasia are members, including India and Japan. And also we know about AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And uh, uh, so in, in that also, Japan and India are also partners. So these are like two world countries. So. How do the panel, and also there is BRI where uh, a lot of Asian countries are members, including, uh, and, also, and of course Russia. So uh, my question to the panelists, first question to the panelists, uh, is that how do you uh, place this uh, China-based organizations, uh, who have this, like, uh, I mean, so-called anti-China organization, and uh, since there are important members who are common to both the forums, so what could be the interplay? This is one. And uh, the second question is more generic one, which is, uh, we all know that despite all this, uh, uh, I mean, military and geostrategic posturing, China and US are still the largest trading partner. And also Jap Japan is also a major trading partner of China. And uh, there are also big volume of trades within the, all these like so-called strategic competitors. So do you see any spillover of this, uh, of this uh, geo, uh, geostrategic and military posturing? into the economic domain and I mean and my my understanding is that that could be that could actually spell a bigger danger so these are the, my two questions to the panel thank you in this world where uh, still we have some somewhat rules of jungles uh, I I would like to ask Tohit Bhai this very question that in this world do you think Bangladesh can really withstand the pressure of being neutral uh, or uh, that we are not with you or we are not with them. Because we have seen the reaction of Chinese ambassador about Bangladesh joining Quad, although Bangladesh has specifically said that they have not yet decided about joining that uh, particular Quad. And given the engagements between Dhaka and Beijing, do you, as the top diplomatic of the country, former top diplomat of the country, believe that Bangladesh can afford to uh, displease China uh, under any circumstances? Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for the floor. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I am Marzuka Vintiausa, a master's student from the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Dhaka. I have two questions to the panelists. Uh, firstly, uh, the triads of AUKUS, especially Could Washington, you speak louder? of course, sir. Uh, the triads of AUKUS, especially Washington, keeps reassuring all the per perplexed states that there is no fear of um, any armed warfare or nuclear warfare, or that there is no need to uh, form any sort of uh, sort of alliance with any uh, powerful state. So uh, my question is. Could AUKUS in the coming future um, uh, calm the fear or pressure of allegiance of the small states in the regions involved by uh, uh, by allowing other multilateral initiatives to move away from the military-centric focus? And my second question is regarding Bangladesh and its economic and military uh, potentials, actually. Um, considering how um, the Australia-Bangladesh Trade and Investment Framework Arrangement, TIFA, was signed uh, at the same time as AUKUS was uh, launched, and in the between the trade between between two countries, Australia and Bangladesh has increased by fifty percent, I think, uh, in two thousand nineteen. Is there any potential for Bangladesh to gain anything at all in this regards, especially um, uh, when it comes to uh, military uh, gains, perhaps? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take one more question. Is in this round and then go back to our speakers and we'll come back to you again. Can I see the hand in the, the rear, please? Yes, sir, you have the floor. Uh, 
Shuam. I'm a fourth year at the University of California, Riverside, uh, studying political science and economics, and I'm, I'm also a research intern at the Institute. So, sir, I have uh, two questions. So, the first question is, um, so the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue's recent joint statement only briefly mentioned about the Southern Asian region. Uh, they particularly talked about Afghanistan. So, my understanding would be they would want to talk about countering violent extremism. So, um, in your expert opinion, how do you think the Quad or... Um, I don't think AUKUS can, but like how the Quad countries can actually engage in violent extremism or countering that in our subcontinent. And the second question is, so there's kind of this battle for narratives between the West and like China. And uh, recently, like uh, as uh, General Munir has like given me an article, it's on the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. They did a study recently on China's footprint in South Asia, and they kind of debunked the myth that China's debt trap or as the popular debt trap policy that has been going around in terms of investments in uh, countries in South Asia, they kind of actually debunked that, okay, these nations actually don't engage in debt trap methodologies. They actually are sufficient. Uh, a lot of people take Sri Lanka as a key example, but uh, the analysts in that report said that Sri Lanka in itself has uh, a bad de uh, debt management policies, but it's not due to BRI investments. So since that there's such a debunking of the um, debt trap policies, how do you think um, South Asian states will react to this? Do you think they will now think that, okay, maybe it's okay to take in more investments? Do you think um, the um, quadrilateral security dialogues, um, FIA and Open Indo-Pacific and their B3W infrastructure project might take a step back in terms of this? Thank you. Dr. Pervez, you have the floor for two minutes. I'll just, uh, I'll, well, thank you. I'll just answer one or two of those issues that were raised. I agree with uh, Shamshir Mubin, sir, but again, Bangladesh needs to be very cautious. And that's what I, I have coined, and I like to say that I have coined, that there's a need for strategic equiproximity. That again, we are not, again, strategic indifferent, but we are, again, there's a similar level of uh, affinity to the major players. And the Sri Lankan ambassador, Excellency, has actually raised a very interesting question. Uh, actually, interesting idea. That is that being is remember non-aligned movement. Right now, it is really out of style. But in the fifties, when you had towering stalwarts like uh, Pandit Nehru or again Suk uh, Sukarno or for that matter Tito, Nasser. So this was actually an ideal platform, and we could actually use the maritime re. A reincarnation of uh, non-aligned movement vis-a-vis -vis Bay of Bengal, whereby we, the smaller nations, uh, in, at least in terms of geographical stature, can actually, or the literal states around Bay of Bengal can come together and where we can associate. And with Sri Lanka, we have a long and a long cultural and historical exchange. And it is via the sea that Prince Vijaya came from all the way from Bengal and set up the first uh, Sinhalese uh, footprint in Sri Lanka. So again, there is a lot of uh, potential to explore. Just two more issues within the last two minutes. There was one question that was raised that again, there are again many organizations or many countries which are part of member organizations which are again funded by the Chinese. And this is the state of what I say, age of ambiguity. China and India have $90 billion straight. Japan is heavily dependent on China for its economic recovery. And as a result, even Vietnam, which is hostile to Chinese intentions, at least 800 years of hostility, is also a member of something which you forgot is RCEP2, which is a Chinese-backed initiative, but also it's a member of CPTPP. So again, everybody's hedging. And again, everybody's hedging. And what does this arms race do? It is good for business. Good for the Chinese. If Myanmar, Bangladesh has a degree of hostility, who is it good for? The global arms suppliers. Good for the global economy. And as for, as for the last part, as for in terms of the law of the jungle, it has always been so. It has been a zero-sum game. We put on a positive spin to it. The West would not have risen if not on the basis of industrial revolution and steam-powered uh, technology. That's how the West dominated us. Now China is reversing the trend. And as a result, you will have, a, uh, you'll have a, obviously, a, a backlash. This is expected. There will not be any pleasantly going in, uh, pleasantly going in or, or fading out of the background. Nothing like this will happen. There will not be co confrontations as per se, but there will be proxy war. Hybrid warfare, and this is the age of ambiguity where no fixed role can be devised or sh sh should be adhered to. Thank you. Two uh, 
observations uh, directly uh, directly directed against uh, towards me so i'll just try to answer those and then maybe a touch on one more um well xi jinping's visit and shri hasina's visit to china now you know uh, strategic relation more than strategic relations these are words these do not mean anything let us face the reality these are uh, these are uh, pleasant words which are uh, exchanged during visits but uh, the reality may often be different because uh, interests uh, come first and for the interest of one it can always go back on what had been said matarbari um, now uh, in the indo pacific strategy it's not only not only military so it also has the economic uh, components and uh, when actually we were invited to join it uh, join into it uh, the americans tried to insist that no 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 it's not military it's basically uh, for economy etc etc also so if japanese ambassador has said it from that point of view there is no problem in in uh, the matarbari uh, port or the project being a part of the in the pacific strategy but uh, uh, definitely uh, it is not going to be a uh, if bangladesh ever theoretically speaking if ever decides to be a part of the indo pacific strategy in the military context then it can have a military connotation otherwise uh, this is a port which will be used for economic and other purposes uh, the second question that was asked was about the um, pressure of remaining neutral uh, you see pressure there is pressure of remaining neutral and also the pressure of joining one side so if you have two friends and there is pressure from both that you join them uh the the uh, situation if you join one becomes even more dangerous than uh you remain neutral in that even if there is pressure uh, so uh in the context of india particularly in india and uh, china bangladesh will have to and is remaining neutral there is no other way because uh, we have vital interests in both countries so we have to remain neutral whether it displeases someone uh, or one of the parties it is okay we have to uh, just sustain that and uh, remain neutral i'll just take half a minute for on another issue which is that um, ambassador shamsul bhavan jodhuri had uh, mentioned very rightly that uh, uh, the there will be uh, you know these uh, posturings and all but there won't be conflicts uh, i personally believe that these these posturings will not lead to a direct conflict but there is one historical problem here the problem is that um let us look forward 20 30 50 years now uh is there going to be a, a passing of the baton in uh, in the domination in the world uh is there is a lot of questions here involved is the us on retreat apparently it is in some respects at least in some places at least uh it was defeated in uh, you know it was defeated in vietnam it has been defeated in uh, afghanistan well a defeat doesn't always mean that the that the vehemoth becomes uh, completely neutralized but then if the us is in retreat and china is definitely on the advance there is no doubt about that and if a time comes when the baton of dominance is to pass from one hand to the other historically this has never happened peacefully except after the first world war uh, uh, second world war when uh, the uh, dominant position that was held by britain was gradually handed over to the us but that was because both these were on the same side it was possible because of this had they had they been on adversarial positions it would not have been so easy and i have an apprehension that in future when the time comes uh, this transition may not be very peaceful thank you uh, thank you very much i think we should uh, uh, we all acknowledge the fact that uh, in the pacific is not a singular construct Uh, there, there, there. It, it is, it is comprised of many important regions and areas, uh, and one of those is the Bay of Bengal. And the Bay of Bengal connects the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So I think within within the Pacific, I think Bay of Bengal is central. And any power, any country, any group of countries, 
chooses to ignore Bay of Bengal, will do so at its own peril. The question is whether uh, the members of this, of the countries that form the, uh, the Bay of Bengal region or situated in the Bay of Bengal region realize how important they are and whether they're willing to play their cards right. Uh, unfortunately, there is dissonance in the Bay of Bengal area, unfortunately. Um, uh, it is to be, it is to be one uh, region at one point in time, uh, but the, there is there is sort of a sort of wall of, of wall of a bit idea uh, that 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 uh, we can work together and we can we can we can sort of cohere uh, and and and, uh, and and make policies that are are beneficial to the uh, and, and good for the common uh, uh, development of these of the countries. And they are lost on us, unfortunately. But Bay of Bengal is central, as is the Indian Ocean, because of the of, of the fact that that I have mentioned. Uh, uh, I think uh, we should uh, we should acknowledge the fact that time has come for China of the US to acknowledge that uh, China is becoming a, a world power. Acknowledge and live with it. The more you try to prevent uh, China from, from, from emerging and playing its own role, the more will you create a situation uh, that will be detrimental to, 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 a, to, a, to a balanced, equitable, egalitarian, peaceful growth of this region. Because if it is the Asian century, it will be led by China, it will be led by Japan, and it will be led by India. Uh, two of them are uh, in, 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 in in sort of have hostile, uh, re, re, not hostile, but uh, they are uh, at at a variance in many 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 issues. Uh, uh, Japan and India vis-a-vis -vis China, but then the fact that China <clears throat> deserves to take its place in the Committee of Nations as a leader, and China China had China has already. Uh, uh, surpassed USA uh, in dollar terms, uh, purchasing power parity terms, uh, uh, GDP. So uh, that is in 2014, seven years ago. Um, uh, it is growing. It is it is going to have in number in in terms of numbers the largest navy. Uh, its reach in terms of strategic reach uh, of its weapons uh, is 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 intercontinental. Look at its uh, look at its. Uh, Hypersonic uh, MIRV capabilities, where it can target multiple uh, uh, targets uh, uh, after entry after reentry in, in, into from outer space. So, therefore, uh, we, 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 need, we, need to, we need to acknowledge this. AUKUS is nothing new. I think it is an old new arrangement. If you remember, I'm, I'm forgetting it. it. There's a 25 years agreement between is then Australian. There's a 25 years agreement between US and Australia, um, some sort of a, a sort of security huh? Uh, not Anzus. No, there, there is separate. Anzus is separate. There is there is a 25 years Australian US uh, uh, agreement. I'm, I'm I'm forgetting. Sorry, it's it's between my mind. So so uh, it, it's perhaps an old new arrangement. Perhaps more. Uh, more, 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 uh, sort of uh, focused, uh, because this is since 1949. This is the uh, first treaty that uh, targets a particular country. I mean, it doesn't say China, but you you you, you look you look at the articulations, you look at the nuanced uh, 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 statements, you you look at the statements of the of the British Foreign Minister uh, uh, talking about China's rise. Uh, so, so there is there is there is no ambiguity as to as to as to what it is against. I don't think U.S. is on the retreat. Or it'll be ever it'll be ever on the retreat. But I think U.S. is suffering from a feeling of vulnerability. That is the rise of China, and I think I think uh, uh, that is what is playing into the minds of of of, of the of the U.S. planners. But as I said, it's not only a threat of countries; it's also the U.S. compulsion uh, to, as I said. To, 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 to keep its military industrial complex running so that its economy flourishes is one of the driving force 
uh, one of the, the what sort of the causal relationship which is what I said I think in I, I think strategic uh, conflict is a remote possibility as, as they say the businessmen of the world will prevent the third world war economic economy drives policies and foreign policies and businessmen will prevent uh, a conflagration between countries as a regional or global so I think uh, on this hopeful note, uh, I will I'll end here. Thank you. Uh, we will be ending soon. So is there any, any last minute question that you have? Okay, I see one hand, two hands. I will first go to Dr. Shasha. Can I say it's a pleasure to be invited to this uh, uh, gathering. And I should introduce myself. My name is uh, Sasha Bullion. I'm first secretary of political of the Australian High Commission. I've been in Dhaka since January this year, and I've loved every minute of it, even during the lockdown, and it's been wonderful to meet people, be invited to events like this, and it's great to be here today. So I just thought I'd um, say a few comments on the, um, uh, as you might expect, a few comments on, uh, on the uh, topics at hand. So, so Australia is, of course, an Indo-Pacific country. We have, uh, we have, an, in, we have an Indo-Pacific lens, an Indo-Pacific vision of the world. We're surrounded by three oceans. We have our, the Indian Ocean on our west, the Pacific Ocean on our east, and the Southern Ocean on our, on our south. It is how we see the world. And of course, there are many different Indo-Pacific uh, visions around the world. I should say we um, share the, we are neighbours with, um, with Bangladesh in the Indo-Pacific, and we are very good friends with, with Bangladesh. I might mention that regard that um, uh, we, of course, uh, greatly respect Bangladesh's uh, foreign, independent foreign policy and we would never ask Bangladesh to take any sides. Our vision for the Indo-Pacific is one, of, one uh, that is open, resilient, and inclusive. It's underpinned by rules, norms, and respect for the sovereignty of all states, large and small states. And our national interests, Australia's national interests, are tied to the stability and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. The future of the Indo-Pacific, as people have mentioned, has global ramifications. And I should mention, as, people, as one of the speakers has said, there are, of course, many perspectives of the Indo-Pacific. Australia has one, the US has another, uh, the EU has one. There are many perspectives. That is fine, we are happy, we are perfectly happy with that. There is not just one vision of the Indo-Pacific. The, the, the reason why the Indo-Pacific has gained greater attention and why we are here today is that there are some real challenges emerging, not emerging, have, they have emerged and may grow larger. There's great power competition in the Indo-Pacific. The rules, norms and institutions are increasingly under pressure. There is increasing tension over territorial claims. There are cyber attacks becoming more frequent and sophisticated. Disinformation and foreign interference is being used to mani manipulate societies and economic coercion is on the rise. Now, the Indo-Pacific is a centre of strategic competition, and that is completely understandable. Different states have different interests, and we understand that. Some competition is inevitable, and it can be uncomfortable. But we want to, Australia wants to cooperate with all countries in the Indo-Pacific to secure a more stable and prosperous regime. I should say our vision for the Indo-Pacific is, is, and this is what drives everything we're trying to do, is where the sovereignty of all countries is respected, regardless of their size of their, or their power. And this is what we're trying to seek to promote through our strategies. If I turn to AUKUS, people have, uh, people have mentioned AUKUS uh, and described it in uh, some detail. It is, of course, a, 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 a trilateral, trilateral uh, technology sharing partnership among three very old friends. Uh, um, probably, I should. The Australia-UK relationship is probably one of the oldest, uh, and certainly we have a very long-standing friendship and relationship uh, uh, with the US. And of course, um, ours, we judge recently, after assessing the strategic environment, that it has deteriorated much more rapidly than we even considered in uh, 2016 in our defence white paper. Military modernisation is occurring at an unprecedented rate, and capabilities are rapidly advancing. And it was after this assessment that we decided to uh, explore uh, 
undertake uh, investigations that eventually led to the uh, decision to uh, uh, seek to acquire nuclear powered submarines. Should be noted, we, we see AUKUS or or as complementing, definitely complementing Australia's other partnerships. Definitely the Quad, ASEAN, the five power, uh, uh, five power defense arrangements, and the Five Eyes. It's definitely a complementary arrangement. Yesterday, people may have seen that Australia and ASEAN agreed on establishing a comprehensive strategic partnership. For us, ASEAN is an extremely important partner um, and one we will, uh, which will remain strong over the years to come. And AUKUS will complement our efforts to ensure the Indo-Pacific remains stable, secure and prosperous and free from coercion. As people have mentioned, AUKUS and the AUKUS partners will collaborate on matters such as cybersecurity, artificial intelligence and quantum technologies. And of course, nuclear powered submarines. Should, I should emphasize, Australia will not seek to uh, develop or acquire nuclear weapons. Our Prime Minister has made that extremely clear. We will continue to meet our obligations on the non-proliferation non treaty, and we're committed to nuclear non-proliferation. We have no plans to develop a civil nuclear power uh, industry. So I just thought I'd uh, uh, put a few words there on the heart of Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Authorization of the Indo-Pacific region, which has uh, the most important trade routes in the world. So what's the vision of Bangladesh or how the economy of Bangladesh would be affected by the militarization of this region? I'm not speaking about certain party, but after all, there will be uh, adversaries in that region. So how will that affect the uh, regional trade and the effect, of the, the, the effect of that on Bangladesh? Thank you. End of the questions. We'll have one minute each to the speakers for their end comments. So can we start with Big Dalam? Uh, US has chosen, chosen uh, Australia as a what guard uh, because the, 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 their, their interests were coterminous. Uh, and, and, just, and because neither India nor Japan was, was willing to blow the war trumpet or beat the war drum on behalf of, uh, of, of the United States. So I think that is a very simple reason, and it it sort of it 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 stands to uh, Australia's uh, benefit to be associated and allied, allied with the United States in thwarting uh, the the quote unquote threat that that they perceive that they perceive emanating from from China. Um, so basically, and and uh, the question about uh, uh, the trade routes being the, the conflict in in this region. I think he can answer better than me, but I can say that uh, an import economy like Bangladesh, if there is if the trades are disrupted, you're uh, you're in trouble. Very simple. Just two questions. Uh, first of all, uh, elaborating with what uh, Brigadier Anam has rightly stated, many of our trade routes are dependent for Singapore centric. So, and we know that there's a Malacca Strait. So, if there is a problem within Malacca or there's a confrontation, if not even a conflict, then again, our supply chain will be disrupted. And again, this will lead to massive inflationary shocks. So we have to think about alternate routes, whether the ports in Sri Lanka can be used or again, furthermore, again, in ports in Iran, Pakistan or other places or overland routes, we have to explore contingency plans, number one. And number two, in terms of Australia being used as a watchdog, I would not uh, I would not actually say so because historically, if you ask the Turks in, during First World War, the Anzac Expeditionary Force, or if you ask, uh, well, he's dead, Marshal Rommel, when he was going for Battle of El Alamein and the Desert Rats, they were all Australians. The Australians are known for their fighting spirit. And again, they have immense contribution for this. And uh, so Australia is also a very natural constituent and it is now identifying more itself with Asia as a whole. So this is also a recalibration of its policy. So this is a natural outcome of this. Thank you. I think the questions have been well taken care of. So, but uh, let me just put in a, a little bit that, uh, say, if there is a militarization, um, because the uh, important world powers are involved, so uh, either there will be a, a, an armed peace, as it used to be at some point of time, and if there is a conflagration, that will not only affect this region, it will be going to affect the entire world. And of course, 
like other countries in the world, Bangladesh will also suffer. But of course, um, uh, we have heard some that there could be some alternate routes. But for example, if we have a lot of, just as we have now, if we have a lot of things to import from China, uh, the port in, uh, say, in, in Sri Lanka may not be of much use because it has to come from China up to, uh, up to uh, Sri Lanka first. And here comes the question of the importance of Myanmar, as we have been insisting that for China, Myanmar is extremely important and paradoxically, paradoxically, trade-wise, it might even become important for us because that might become the route for our important imports from China. Thank you. I will not attempt to summarize anything because this has been a, such a rich discussion, but just to mention a point about Mariam's last question, as Toid rightly mentions that perhaps our biggest asset can be the port of Chakpu, even if Malacca Straits gets blocked or stopped by any means. That also brings me to the worry that why Matarbari is so sensitive? Matarbari is so sensitive because it is in close proximity to Chakpu. It is also in close proximity to Simek. So Matarbari will have deep strategic interest and consequences. But to say the last words in my segment is that what is happening in the Indo-Pacific is classical. It is the classical space for battle for rise of powers. Something that we see, we have seen in the Atlantic post Second World War. We are seeing that now happening in the Indo-Pacific. But my hope is that the so-called new Cold War probably will not go hot because there is much at stake here and nations are much more mature. But we should all be prepared for other forms of warfare. My apprehension is that we will see more warfare in the gray zones, for example. We have to watch our gray zones, then we, we should watch more than our borders now. And new forms of hybrid warfare are coming. So therefore, the battle space will move to other domains than the classical military battles. And as a small nation, but a significant strategic player, Bangladesh needs to take note of all these new developments so that we can play our rightful share. With that hope, I will now pass it back to Mr. Zafar Soban for the closing remarks. Uh, thank you very much, General Munir. There's not really much I can add to uh, what you have just said. I think that was a very eloquent uh, closing. And I just would like to thank all three of our panelists. I would like to thank um, BIPS for partnering with Dhaka Tribune on this initiative and all of you who've taken the time to be part of what I think has been a very important initiative, a very important discussion. Um, I should mention that we're hoping to make this a monthly joint initiative of BIPS and Dhaka Tribune. And I think this kind of a forum, this kind of a platform where we discuss geostrategic and geopolitical issues is really much needed. I think a number of the speakers, including the panelists, have talked about how, you know, the new great game is upon us in the strategic importance of the Indo Pacific region and what are the implications thereof for Bangladesh? Because we are, as again many people have mentioned, you know, we are a significant country, um, maybe seventh or eighth most populous in the world right now, growing economy, strategically extremely well positioned, and we stand to gain and lose from whatever. Uh, greater games are being played in the region and globally. So this is of extreme importance to us, and it's, of course, of extreme importance to many other countries, many of whom I see uh, uh, represented well here. And I think this kind of um, discussion is long overdue, and I'm so glad that we are actually having it. We will see you again a month from now, and um, we can keep this, uh, this discussion going. Thank you very much, everyone.